I'm going to ask you to turn to two scriptures this morning. The first one is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Okay? Put your finger there in your Bible and flip back to Romans. Just a couple of books back to the left. Flip back to Romans chapter 5. And put your finger there. We're going to read the Corinthian passage first. How many of you need a word of encouragement this morning? Boy, I do. I, I, I mean, I, I'm serious. I really do. Man, this morning would not be the appropriate morning to come and preach hellfire and brimstone. Yeah. It just wouldn't fly this morning. And so I'm not going to do that. This morning, I really want you to sit back and relax. We're going to take our time going through the scriptures that I want to share with you this morning. We're going to allow God's word to seep down into the soil of our hearts and minister to us. And when we leave here this morning, I really believe that every one of us will be full of the glory of the Lord and encouraged in his power and strength. That's what I'm believing and seeking for this morning. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. That you through his poverty might be made rich rich. Title of my message this morning is From Rags to Riches. From Rags to Riches. So let's take a look at Romans chapter 5 beginning at verse 1. The first word in that passage is the word therefore. Now I've taught you all when you're reading your Bible and you come to a therefore what does that mean and what should you do? Who's going to be brave enough to tell me? Huh? No. You should always pay attention. Go back. Therefore, tells you that something came before. And therefore is referring you back to what was previously stated in order to make what is about to be stated clearer to you, okay? And here's what was stated in chapter 4. In chapter 4, uh, Paul, the writer, talks about the faith of Abraham, that he believed God, and because of his faith in God, it was accounted to him as righteousness. Also, in chapter 4, Paul describes the life of David as also illustrating justification by faith. Now, what is the word justification? What does that mean? Well, it's a judicial term, and, it, and it's like God declaring you not guilty. It would be like God is the magistrate, and you are brought before the court by Satan, the accuser of the brethren, and he's reading the laundry list of all the evil that you have done in your life, and God's sitting there and listening to it, and then after Satan makes his case, he says, I find you not guilty, and you're cleansed. And justification means that by that cleansing, you are now made righteous. Okay? You're made righteous. So now let's enter chapter 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produce patience. I'm sorry, produce perseverance. And perseverance, character. And character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Okay? Now, before we go into unpacking the next verse, which is verse 6, and your Bible, it, those, what I just read is probably in paragraph form. And verse 6 begins a new paragraph. I need to remind you that there were no divisions like that in the original manuscripts. It was just one continuous declaration of the Word of God. But having said that, let me point to the first word in verse 6. What is that word? The word is for. Well, when you see a for in Scripture, what the, the, does that mean? What is what it is saying is, because of what I have just stated, now I can say this. And so what Paul is saying here, because when we were still sinners and without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were sinners, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the re reconciliation. Okay, this passage of Scripture, boy, you need to mark it somehow in your Bible. And so when you turn that page and you see that, you'll come back and examine it again because this portion of scripture is a spiritual gold mine a spiritual gold mine which we are going to mine this morning and from this passage we are going to count our many blessings blessing number one by the grace of God through Jesus Christ, according to Paul's writings in this portion of Romans, the fifth chapter, number one, we have peace. Amen. We have peace with God. Where once we are children of wrath, we were children of the devil, we were children living in alienation from God. Now, by Christ and the imputed righteousness that is ours through justification, we are now children of God. From children of the devil to children of God. That's our first major blessing. Where we were once at enmity with God, we are now made one with him. We have peace with God, and we have peace in God. Think about that for a minute. Peace with God means that we're no longer children of the enemy. We've been reconciled to God, and we're one with him. We have peace with God. Peace in God means that by his Holy Spirit living in me, and as I live out my days here on planet Earth, I have his peace actively working in my life. 
peace with God and peace in God. And the peace that I have in God grows in me as I mature as a Christian. I begin to experience greater and greater dimensions of peace. I get up in the morning and I say, Lord, I'm not going to worry about today. Why should I worry? I have peace in you. I can trust in you. Chase said it this morning. Just take a look at all that he's done in the past for you and realize that that is a reflection of what he's prepared for you to do in the future of your life. And therefore, don't get anxious about it. Just live in the peace of God. Don't let life rock your boat, okay? So our first spiritual blessing is we have peace. Our second spiritual blessing is, according to verse 2, the first part, we have access to God. We read that when Jesus hung on the cross and gave his spirit to the Lord, when he said to Telestai, it is finished, the Bible tells us that the veil in the temple that separated the holy court from the most holy court was torn from top to bottom. And that's symbolic of the fact that by the crucifixion of Christ and the sacrifice that he made, we as Christians, as child of God, can enter directly into his presence. The Bible tells us, it encourages us, come boldly into the throne of grace. Especially, the Bible says, in time of need. Do you have a need this morning? Well, come boldly to the Father and declare that need to Him. You don't need it, a priest. See, in the Old Testament, it was only the priest that talked to God. I had to go to the priest and say, hey, I need something, and he would relay that to God. With the rending of that veil in the temple, now I go directly into God. I crawl up on his lap and I say, Father, I need a job. I need healing. I need peace in my family. I need to know your presence in my life. Whatever it is, just go directly to him and make that need known. Third, the third spiritual blessing as revealed in this portion of Scripture, and that's found in the second half of verse number two. By the sacrifice of Christ, we have hope. Hope. And I'm not talking about the hope that maybe you oftentimes think of. It's not a, well, I hope so. It's not that. That's a statement of hoping that something will come to fruition. The hope that we have in Christ is an established fact that something is going to come to fruition. It's an earnest desire. It's a, it's a, the Greek word is a word that is, is, means to anticipate. To impi- anticipate what you're hoping for. And, it, and it, it's described as blessed assurance. To know and be assured by God that your hope is a settled thing with the Lord. Listen to Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Again, Paul's writing, and he says to them, he's talking about believers, children of God. He says to them, God will to make known what are the riches, what are the riches of the glory of this mis- mis- I'm sorry, mystery among the Gentiles. To th- this is very important. I'm going to do it again. To them, God willed to make known 
what are the riches, and that's what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about being made rich in Christ. So God wanted to make known to all of us what are the riches of the glory of this mystery. The mi a mystery is something that was hidden, but now has been brought to the light. And what Paul is describing here is the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ that was hidden from Old Testament people, but with the advent of Jesus Christ and his crucifixion and resurrection has now been made visible to us. It's been revealed. And here's what's been revealed. What the revelation is, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So the hope that we have in Jesus Christ is actually manifested in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So we don't have to wonder if we have a future home and glory. The Bible teaches that the hope that God has placed in us is actually a down payment. It's called an earnest payment. It's our down payment on the home that's reserved for us in glory at this moment. It's there awaiting our arrival. And we're assured of that by the hope that is in us through Christ Jesus. So we don't have to wonder. We don't have to worry. We have blessed assurance that that is true. God is not a man that he should lie. And if God says it, you can count on it. That's the third spiritual blessing. Each one of these, I hope you see, is really a, a chunk of gold. They're golden. The fourth one, found in verses 3 through 4, declares that we have daily confidence. Now, this is important. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulations. He said that in John chapter 16 at verse 33. And the Bible is perfectly clear. As long as we inhabit these bodies and live on planet Earth, there are going to be wars and plagues and fires and all types, hurricanes, and all types of tribulations. They're just a part of life here on planet Earth. But the good news is our confidence is in knowing, again, having that hope that we have a future home, that we're just passing through this life. This is just a temporary home until we get to glory where we will live forever without any of these things. But yet the trials that we experience here on earth, according to the Bible, work to our good. And sometimes they may not seem like it. You know, how do these fires and these calamities and how does COVID and how those things work to our good? We can't understand how that works to our good. Well, Job couldn't understand how, how killing all of his children and taking away all of his possessions and reducing him to a, a man covered with boils, sitting in dust and scraping the boils with a piece of stone. He didn't know what the end was. And those of us who have read the book of Job know that though he lost all that stuff and it was Sad. I'm not saying that that was easy on him. That was a very tr trauma-producing time. That was a, a bad situation. But you read the story, and it worked together for his good. It really did. It worked together for his good. So it said, the Bible says that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance produces character and then that character as it grows in us produces hope once again assurance in God assurance that though I've been displaced by a fire God has not abandoned me he is with me this was a part of his plan certainly not a part of my plan he knew it was going to happen, although I didn't. But he's in it, 
and I can count on him that when this is all said and done, I will be in better shape than I was before it happened. That is one of the mysteries of the Bible. That God takes the very bad things of this life and what does Romans 8, 28 say? You all know that verse. He uses them for good, right? To those who love him and are called by his name. So our fourth chunk of gold, our fourth spiritual blessing, according to Romans 5, is that we have confidence. We have daily confidence. Daily confidence. The fifth blessing that we have, according to this passage, and it's found in verses 5 through 11, is we experience the love of God. Those of us who are his children, who have been declared righteous by the process of justification that I described earlier, we experience the love of God. Paul says in verse 8, God demonstrates his own love. In other words, he makes it visible. His love is on display. Well, Pastor Sandy, where, where is it displayed? Where, where has it been displayed? It was displayed on the cross when Jesus gave his life for your sins and he secured your justification by paying the penalty that you owed and declaring you sin-free and righteous. It can be seen there. And the love of God is a love that we can't understand as human beings. It's an agape love. It's a, God, a love that's all giving and requires nothing in return. And so when Jesus gave his life, that's a demonstration, a demonstration of the love of God that we experience through his sacrifice. Jesus gave everything. He withheld absolutely nothing when he died in our place. And the scripture says, when we were without strength, when we were without strength, we were like dead men. We were dead in trespasses and sins. How much strength and ability to do anything does a dead man have? Absolutely none. Do you agree with me? Absolutely none. But while we were dead in sin, the Bible says right here that God demonstrated his love for us. And, and when did he do it? Did he do it when we deserved for him to do it? No, it says right here that he did it for the ungodly. When you and I were living apart from God, when you and I were estranged from God, we might have heard of him, we might have go to a church where they talk about him, but we were not in relationship with him by the sacrifice of Jesus. We were estranged from him, and it was during that time that we didn't look very beautiful to him when he looked down, but he created us. We were still his children. And while we were ungodly, Jesus went to the cross and died for us. Imagine that. Paul says, scarcely for a good man, someone would die. But maybe there might be someone that would die for a wicked person. And we know that there was. It's the person of Jesus Christ. While we were sinners, while we were living in rebellion, while we were haters of God. Whoa, wait a minute, Pastor Sandy. I didn't hate God. Well, maybe not in your heart. Maybe you didn't walk around, oh, I hate God. I just hate God. But by your behavior, by ignoring him, 
by refusing in your own conscience to do what you know is the right things to do, but living in your own way, you were hating God. And it was during that time that he died for you. Imagine that. It's by God's grace that he gives us what we don't deserve. Grace is all about giving us, you and I, what we don't deserve. And the other side of that is mercy. We always hear about the mercy and grace of God. Okay, if grace is giving us what we don't deserve, then what's mercy? Well, let me tell you, mercy of God is not giving us what we do deserve. Huh? Not giving us what we do deserve. So by God's grace, we're alive today. We're filled by his Holy Spirit, and we're able to experience and enjoy all these things that I'm describing to you this morning. So we can see his love at the cross. We can see his love in that he gave us his Holy Spirit. In verse 5, it says, The love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So we experience the love of God by the person of the Holy Spirit who now lives inside of us. And the agape love that I spoke of a moment ago now lives inside of us by way of the Holy Spirit. And so when Jesus said, by this, they will know that you're my disciples, he's talking about by the agape love that is demonstrated in and through your life, when you stand out as different from the other people in the world who are seeking their own, and you're sacrificing to help others and give the others, the people in the world are going to see that you're his disciple because you're not like everybody else. Number six. Having been justified by his blood, it says in verse number nine, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Okay, again, remember justification. We're not guilty. We're made righteous by Christ's sacrifice. He bore the penalty, and now we're justified. We're not guilty. And it says, because we are justified, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Okay. Believers will not go to hell. Believers will not go to hell. Jesus said in John chapter 5 at verse 24, he says this, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me, speaking of the Father, has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into light, one, life. Once again, the everlasting life that we have now, we are going to have for all time. And then in Romans chapter 8, and this is a verse that we all need to be familiar with. It says, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So no one's going to condemn us. Satan will come and try to condemn us. He'll come and whisper in your ear how worthless you are. And because of the sins that remain in your life, God really doesn't love you. But let me remind you, God knew of those sins when he called you into fellowship with him. He knows the sins that you're going to commit today and the sins that you're going to commit tomorrow. Does that mean that you have permission to do them? Heavens, no. But we don't have to be... Uh, uh, sifted by Satan when he comes to say, oh, look at all that you've done. God doesn't love you. There's no condemnation for those who believe in God through Christ Jesus. Believers will not go to hell. Believers will not experience the coming tribulation. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9. 
You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even so Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. I mean, this is as bad as it's going to get for you and me. This is our hell. What we're living in right now, this is our hell. And I'll be first to say, it's hell. But it's nothing to compare to the place where people who live apart from God are going to spend the rest of their lives. This has no comparison to that place. And it says that we're going to be delivered from that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9 says, For God did not appoint us, us, you and me, for God did not appoint you and me to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. What, what he's saying is that through Jesus Christ, whether we live in this life or die in this life, we're always with him. And it's never in hell because he's delivered us from those tribulations. That's number six. Num you didn't know you were this rich, did you? Y'all okay? Y'all doing okay? Number seven. Here's our seventh spiritual blessing as found in Romans 5, 1 to 11. We have received reconciliation. Believers by way of reconciliation, that term means that we were bought by a price, we were bought out of the guilt that we were in and reconciled to Christ. And reconciliation means that by the sacrifice of Christ, believers are made one with God. One with God. We are filled with his love and with his person in the power of, spirit, of the Spirit. The person of the Spirit. And now we are inseparable. Inseparable. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor death nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Are you glad? Are you glad that you're one with God and nothing can separate you from the unity that you have in God? You know, as I prepared this message, I'm always trying to come up with illustrations that really have an impact and really say what this says. And so I was going to bring two items with me this morning. And I decided to leave them at home because I didn't want to take the, the time to do it. But let me share a thought with you. And you ladies will get it more than you guys. But maybe some of you guys will get it. Have you ever made jello? Huh? You've made jello? Okay, to make jello, you start with water, right? So I was going to bring a glass of water. And at home right now, if you looked at my desk, there's a box of cherry jello sitting on my desk that I was going to bring. Okay, so you got a glass of clear water and you got a box of jello. So you take the jello and you pour it into the water and you stir it up. What happens to the water? Those of you that have made jello, what happens to the clear glass water? Huh? Somebody speak up. It turns into jello. No. It's no longer clear, is it? It's red. And it's red through and through. Would you agree? 
There's not a clear spot in there anywhere. It's red through and through. What if I hand you a spoon and a jello bowl and I said, okay, I want you to dip the jello out of there and just leave the water there. So you're in there trying to dip out those jello crystals that you had poured in. Would you be able to do it? That's you with God. You are one in God and inseparable in God. Nothing can separate you from God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you're that way today, and guess what? You're going to be that way every day and through eternity. Praise God. Praise God. Did you like my jello illustration? Yeah, it was very good. All right. All right. Then I can take my box of jello and put it back in the pantry. Susie's not over there. She didn't know that I went and got that jello out of the pantry. Okay. That's my introduction. All that I've said right now up to this point is my introduction. Now, are you ready for the sermon? No, I'm serious. Are you ready for the sermon? Okay, I've got three points. Three points. And we can find them in verses 10 and 11 of the passage that we're examining this morning. Verse 10 says this, For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. So once we're reconciled, declared justified, and made one with Christ, we are safe. We will be saved by God, and nothing can separate us. So point number one, here's point number one. By his death, we were reconciled to God. By that, we see God's grace active in our past. Whenever you were saved, you were instantaneously transformed from an enemy of God to a child of God. Amen. Grace in the past. Reconciliation. And God did it all. Once again, you were dead in trespasses and sin. You couldn't do anything to save you. You didn't come to Jesus. You know, people, well, I came to Jesus in 1978. No, you didn't. You didn't come to Jesus. He, he came to you. He came to you and accepted you and called you in. Okay, so point number one, by his death we're reconciled to God. Point number two, by his life we shall be saved. Okay, now you, are you picking up on the verb tense here? By his death we were saved. That happened in the past. By his life, we shall be saved. It's talking about now and into our future. So it's grace now and for all time. Hebrews seven twenty five. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And right now, Jesus is at the right hand of God. And he's always superintending your life and interceding for you and standing before God as your advocate. First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. Once again, there's the hope that's alive within us through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. To an inheritance, once again, there's our future in heaven that is incorruptible and undefiled and does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you and you and you and for every one of us who are kept by the power of God. Nothing can separate us from the power of God who are kept by the power of God through faith 
for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Well, wait a minute. What do you mean salvation ready to be revealed in the last time? That sounds like that's something that's going to happen in the future. I thought I was saved right now. This is talking about the consummation of your salvation when you finally stand in the presence of the Lord Almighty in heaven. We're kept by him. And nothing can separate us. Okay, point number two, we shall be saved. Okay, here's point number three. Again, we're talking about the love that has been made visible by all that we've talked about in Romans chapter 5. Verse 11, I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. It says, so now, and there again, words are important. The word so now mean having been because something has happened. So now having been made rich, I'm plugging that in and I'm not doing an injustice to the text by plugging it in. So now having been made so rich, we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God. Because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. So here's my third point. By his grace, by the love that's demonstrated through Christ, as a result of our justification, we have a new friendship with God that will fill all of our days. All of our days here and there will fill all of our days with wonder and joy wonder and joy you remember the song I got the joy 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 down in my heart down in my heart down in my heart I got a little cartoon on the internet it's a little kitten maybe some of you have seen it I've posted it on Facebook several times and it's a real cute little cat if you're singing that song I got the joy 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 down in my heart and in the back ear the chorus go where and he goes down in my heart where down in my heart I got the joy I got the joy of the Lord down in my heart and we're gonna have that every day why because we're friends with God we are children of God we live in fellowship, unbroken, undivided fellowship with God. So in that, we have joy. I wrote this to close with. You guys want to come up? How many of, her, of you have heard of this guy, George Soros? He's a wicked man, but he's reputed to be one of the richest, if not the richest man on the face of the earth today. But here's what I wrote. Regardless of one's net worth, you and I, the children of God, are the richest people on earth and all because of the love of God in Christ Jesus. You and I, brothers and sisters, I want you to get in touch with it. Let that seep down into your soul. Let it find bedrock in the depths of your being. You are rich. You're one of the richest people on the face of this earth. So can we lift our hands and praise him for his greatness as they lead us in one last song and then you'll be dismissed. If you need prayer, someone will meet you right over here. I will just say now, God bless you. Go out of here and have a wonderful, wonderful day. And if you have opportunity, tell somebody about Jesus and how rich they can be in him. Okay? God bless you. You have been listening to Pastor Teacher Dr. Sandy Shoemaker from Park Community Church 
located in Shingle Springs, California. If this message has touched you in any way and you would like more information about the Christian life, or if you would like to submit a prayer request, please do not hesitate to contact us at church at parkcommunity.org. If you would like to acquire more information about our church, please visit our website at parkcommunity.org.